This lecture is on fractures of the humeral shaft. I'm Saqib Rahman. I am going to be narrating this uh, lecture uh, authored by uh, uh, Dr. Della Rocca most recently and uh, previous authors as uh, listed below. And this is from the Orthopedic Trauma Association uh, Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series uh, version 3. Um, so here we go. So introduction, so humeral fractures are traditionally treated non-surgically. This is one of those long bone uh, fractures um, that uh, actually doesn't get operated on as often and um, typically can have pretty satisfactory outcomes without being anatomically reduced. Um, strong bias formally existed uh, against surgical intervention due to high rates of complications, um, but both operative and non-operative treatments have been refined over time. So anatomy, uh, the humeral diaphysis extends from the upper border of the insertion of the pec major proximally to the supracondylar ridge distally. And fracture alignment is determined by the location of the fracture relative to the major muscle attachment. So uh, you have the pectoralis uh, major and deltoid attachments uh, proximally that, um, that uh, cause this as shown here. So here are some of the deforming forces seen. Um, a fracture distal to the pec major attachment, uh, but proximal to the deltoid tuberosity. Okay, so uh, you can see that's shown right here. Okay, and that will cause, and it's, I know this is hard to see, but I mean, here's the humerus fragment, and it is like this. Okay, so you can see this is going to cause adduction of the proximal fragment here. Um, you know, maybe in the proximal third. Uh, fracture distal to the deltoid tuberosity uh, will cause ab, um, sort of this abduction and possibly some shortening. Not always shortening, but uh, you'll see this abduction or certainly some varus because of the uh, deltoid uh, inserting onto that uh, deltoid tuberosity here, pulling it this way. Okay. <clears throat> so let's just briefly talk about some uh, fracture classifications. Uh, you can certainly just use fracture descriptors, look at the location, pattern, low energy versus high energy. And these are common um, descriptors we use when uh, discussing fractures amongst surgeons, whether it's open or closed, using those classifications. Here's um, AOOTA classification. So uh, the uh, humerus would be uh, bone number one, okay? Um, and uh, a, um, uh, the um, fracture can be uh, subclassified as um, uh, shown here. You can have an A, B, or C. Okay, the C's are the uh, more common nuded fractures, and just just an example of that. And breaks down to C1.1, for instance. Um, but essentially, the uh, humeral diaphysis would be a uh, uh, fracture number. 12. Okay, one for humerus, two for, for middle third. Um, mechanism of injury uh, is another way you can describe fractures, either direct um, or indirect forces uh, by impact or possibly some type of rotational force. Um, physical examination, uh, you want to sort of look for uh, obviously pain, swelling, deformity, associated injuries. And this is really important here, document the neurovascular exam, okay? Because many times uh, patients uh, are gonna have an evolving exam. It may be different uh, when they come in uh, than it is later on, and you have different people examining the patient. So it's important to get an exam, it's important to document your exam, okay? And particularly the radial nerve function, as should be evident because of the location of the radial nerve, uh, uh, which is intimate to these fractures in many cases. So what about imaging? Um, it's a long bone, it's in the, the humerus. It's typically uh, very well imaged with uh, plain radiographs. CT, sc CT scans really aren't that critical uh, for these. Um, of, of course, unless you're worried about intraarticular involvement or, or something like that. Um, AP, lateral views. Uh, sometimes you have to get a transthoracic lateral view. Uh, and of course, you want to see a, a joint above and a joint below. Um, and if the x-rays aren't clear, of course, other imaging can be helpful. If you're worried about a tumor, an MRI can be helpful. So as we opened up with uh, 
uh, we, we mentioned that um, many humeral fractures are amenable to closed non-surgical treatment. All right, and rigid immobilization is not necessary for healing. Um, and uh, going way back, you can see this is some very old uh, data here, but um, perfect alignment is not essential for an acceptable, acceptable result. So it's very different than femur or tibia or uh, the forearm, um, where um, you can accept uh, quite a significant degree of, of shortening and angulation and still have a uh, satisfactory result. So um, here are some of the uh, requirements you know, traditionally for uh, non-surgical treatment. Well, firstly, you have to understand uh, some of the anatomy and uh, muscular deforming forces that we talked about. You have to understand the postural deforming forces and the forces that can help you with the reduction. Uh, non-surgical treatment is a little bit more tedious than surgical treatment. Of course, the surgical treatment itself is tedious, but once it's over, um, it's not quite as much as non-surgical treatment, which requires you to see the patient every week, lots of adjustments uh, made to fitting the brace properly, checking the skin. Um, you're not sure if it's gonna hold reduction and um, a little bit more anxiety uh, to some degree. You have to have a cooperative, preferably upright and mobile patient. So you can imagine uh, the opposite of this would be some patient with a head injury in the ICU, um, you know, a trauma patient um, would, would not be a good example of that. And you have to have what you consider to be an acceptable reduction. So what is acceptable? Well, because the shoulder and elbow uh, or joints capable of wide ranges of motion, the arm is thought to be able to accommodate um, the following. Uh, and here are the numbers here on the slide without significant compromise or function or appearance. Okay, so um, these are some of the numbers that you'll hear quoted often. I think it's fair to say this has not been proven. And it's interesting, I mean, there's more um, uh, studies. There was a very recent study in the journal Orthopedic Trauma trying to look and see um, about uh, how much function is lost with uh, this degree of uh, angulations. So uh, with closed treatment, initial mobilization could be with a coaptation splint, maybe a hanging arm cast, and most surgeons will go to a functional fracture brace in the subacute phase, seven to 10 days, or around about that time. Um, you know, a coaptation splint can offer better support for um, uh, the fracture early on because it can get much more proximal than a coaptation splint. If you can kind of see where the axilla is here. Uh, you can imagine even with a brace that you get as high as you possibly can, it's going to sort of be here, right? So it gets very close to the fracture site itself. And uh, whereas a co-optation splint that comes up and over the top uh, potentially is going to have um, better control proximally. Um, but that's usually, you know, just initial management. Um, uh, Augusta Sarmiento um, helped popularize functional bracing. Uh, this is a nice example of functional brace sewn here. Uh, you can see this allows free shoulder motion, free elbow motion. Um, and uh, in his um, reports, there was very high uh, rate of union with uh, good functional restoration um, and minimal complications. Now, this is, these are some of the keys. Again, non-operative treatment and functional fracture bracing, it does not mean neglect or putting it in a cast and just sort of waiting to see what happens. Um, it's an active process. Not only does it require some tedious follow-up, but you have to tell the patient that they have to move their joints. So it affects fracture reduction through soft tissue compression. All right? So if they're not doing anything, uh, the muscles are not contracting, they're not compressing, and you will not maintain alignment. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, in the humerus, you have a lot of distraction forces, uh, and you can counteract those with active elbow flexion and extension, okay? Uh, you have that shell, plastic shell, typically with Velcro straps. You have to always keep them tight. You know, they can be, they can be applied acutely or following application of a coaptation splint, which I think would, most places do. Most places don't have the uh, braces immediately available like in the emergency department. 
and success depends on an upright patient. You have to tighten those straps, constantly be adjusting it, and you can't really lean on the elbow. You have to get some type of gravity-assisted reduction. And honestly, um, whereas I think a lot of people typically use a sling, um, sling, you know, it, number one, it doesn't allow motion of the elbow. Number two, um, it counteracts the sort of gravity-assisted reduction. So, um, you know, real functional treatment, you would, you would not really have a sling. Uh, you could have a cuff and collar where you have something just going around the neck and around the wrist to support the hand, which can be easily slipped out for motion exercises and also allows the gravity reduction, which you sort of counteract with a sling. Now, contraindic uh, contraindications to functional bracing are uh, bad open fractures, massive soft tissue loss, bone loss, unreliable or uncooperative patient. Um, like I said, for instance, I think a really good example is a hospitalized patient with a head injury and uh, weighing supine. Um, another uh, contraindication is an inability to get acceptable alignment or maintain it. And if you have um, significant fracture gapping, that can increase the risk of non-union. So um, surgical intervention is preferable in specific cases. Um, uh, you know, those with, um, and, and there's many factors that, that play a role that are both uh, related to the injury and the x-rays, but then also patient-related factors. So um, indications for ORAF, the injury factors are failed closed treatment, loss of reduction, poor patient tolerance or compliance, uh, failure, uh, failure of union with closed treatment, um, open fractures are an indication for ORAF or surgical management, I should say, uh, vascular injury, uh, a floating elbow, meaning a humerus and a forearm fracture, um, associated intraarticular fractures. Um, so if you have distal humerus fracture extending into the shaft, uh, major nerve injury like a brachial plexopathy um, or um, other chronic problems, non-union, delayed union. Um, uh, these are indications for operative management infection, unfortunately. Um, but out of these, only open fractures and those with vascular injury are absolute indications for surgical intervention. So some of the patient factors are um, a polytrauma patient. Right, so not only because the patient's laying flat and is unable to participate, but also because they need to be mobilized. Right, they have uh, head injuries, burns, chest trauma, or multiple fractures, and they need to use crutches, so they need to use their arms, and you can't really do that in a brace. Um, uh, but um, uh, the patient, uh, so another indication would be a patient who's unable to be upright, uh, bilateral humerus fractures. Uh, pathologic fractures and, and morbid obesity. And the reason for that is uh, it's very difficult to maintain alignment typically with uh, morbid obesity um, and uh, uh, pendulous breasts, for instance, are another um, reason where you may have to go to operative management for inability to maintain alignment closed. All right, so um, I'm going to pause here, and we will uh, pick up on the uh, surgical management uh, in the next set of slides. Thanks.